Oh, we are now. It says live in yellow. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to Good Friends of Jackson Elias. Uh, this week, an occasional video podcast um, about Call of Cthulhu. Horror films. Yeah, and horror gaming in general. But this week, not so much about Call of Cthulhu, in fact. Um, we should just do a quick introduction of ourselves. I'm Paul Fricker. I'm Scott Dalwood. And I'm Matt Sanderson. Uh, you can find out more about the show at blasphemoustomes.com um, where there'll be notes and information about this week's show. And this week we do something different because we have a very special guest, uh, games designer, novelist, and video game designer, Raphael Chandler. Welcome, Good Raphael. Good morning. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Okay, Scott, I think um, you're going to kick things off. Uh, yes, so um, Raphael, let, let, let's let's start with the um, with the one that's closest to the hearts of our listeners. Um, I, you you do a lot of very kind of gory uh, uh, horror stuff. Um, uh, your horror runs through you know pretty much everything you write. Um, I've seen a, a fair number of Lovecraftian influences in, in some of the stuff you've written. Uh, can you just talk us through some of that? Sure. Um... I'm a huge fan, and every morning <laughs> I kiss this. Uh, no, I uh, yeah, I played a lot of Call of Cthulhu uh, as a as a teen, and read all of Lovecraft's work, and so it's inevitable that a lot of his ideas have sort of seeped into my my fiction and my video games even. Uh, there's a video game that I worked on that uh, mentions Lovecraftian entities by name, uh, but they're, you know, the references are pretty subtle. There's a giant um, underwater complex called Dagon and so forth. And uh, I guess the first one would be my novel Hex Communicated, which is about a terrorist group called al -Hazred. Clearly, um, an, an, a reference to the author of the Necronomicon. But what's interesting about this, to me anyhow, is that al Hazred is not uh, your standard terrorist organization operating out of the Middle East. In fact, the idea is what if Lovecraft were a member of a terrorist organization? What if there were a bunch of people like him who were utterly xenophobic New Englanders who were absolutely terrified at what's happening to the world? What if they were so frightened of multiculturalism, so repulsed by half-breeds and miscegenates? Because that's what I would be to Lovecraft. Were he and I to meet, he would look upon me with revulsion. He would say, here we have this intermingling of human and Latino. And so that's... Uh, you know, and I'm always conflicted about that, that element of his work. Mm -hmm. So that's what Hex Communicated, my novel, is ultimately about. It's about race, which is kind of a strange um, concept, considering that it's advertised as a book about vampires and werewolves. Yeah, I, I, is, is that something that you're going to explore more explicitly in, in follow-up books? Because, I, mean, I mean, it's certainly there in, in the first book, but I, I know you're, you're writing a, a series of these. Um, I just wondered whether you know, you've been to explore the motivation of Al Hazred more as the book went on, the series went on. Yeah, the second novel, Extermination, takes place soon after the events of, of the first novel. And in the sequel, we learn more about this terrorist group and their, their goals and their, like I said, their, their revulsion at the idea of miscegenation and, and multiculturalism. And uh, eh, they're, they're basically they're, they're Nazi tendencies. They're, they're master race philosophy, which makes them especially dangerous to the team, which includes people of all races in the, in the first novel and in the second novel. We, we were exposed to a, a pretty diverse group of characters who are all personally threatened by this philosophy. In, in addition, the Lovecraftian elements come through uh, a bit more uh, blatantly in the second novel because we actually have entities like Gugs. Um, and I, if he comes back from the dead to sue me, I guess there's not a whole hell of a lot I can do about it, but there are Gugs and Migos and whatnot in the uh, in the second <laughs> novel. And I think you're on pretty safe ground. Yeah, it's, it's become part of our cultural lexicon. 
Yeah. And his his work has has seeped into uh, damn near every horror writer's work that I've ever read, in one way or another. I mean, Barker, King, everybody has has sort of experimented with his tropes, or or in some way alluded to his work. Um, and some of them actually have continued it. You know, I've actually participated in new mythos stories, which is fantastic. But yeah, the second novel does delve into that a little bit more explicitly. The first novel was about establishing the world, establishing the threat, and also this this mystery, this investigation, which had semi Lovecraftian elements to it. You know, the uh, some of the the footage of the destruction of the city of Providence had these giant cyclopean monstrosities rampaging through the city, uh, much like Thulu rising from from his watery grave. So, yeah, the second one sort of delves into that a bit more. So, so are these, entities, these monsters, are they summoned up by the al Hazred um, terrorist organization to strike at the, uh, the, 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 the immigrants and the, the people of, uh, that they don't like? Yeah, but I wouldn't necessarily use the word summoning, although it hasn't really been explicitly detailed in the text. Nobody knows what happened at Providence. Of course, there are conspiracy theories. It was an inside job, or it was terrorists, um, a new life form, an alien attack, the government, you know, quarantined the city and just bombed the living hell out of it, and it's just a smoking ruin. So no one knows exactly, was it magic? Well, this book is very heavily focused on technology. What, I guess, is slightly different from other urban fantasy novel series is that the vampires in question are ordinary people who undergo surgery and who undergo uh, alterations, surgical alterations, to become superhuman soldiers. And that actually stems from a lot of the work that I did in the video game industry. When I was working on the Tom Clancy games as a writer on Rainbow Six Lockdown, and I also worked on several of the Ghost Recon games, we did a lot of research into the future of war, beginning with uh, programs that would, at least in the short term, augment soldiers with uh, helmet cams and gun cams, um, monitors that would track blood pressure. There was also speculation about exoskeletons, uh, ballistic uh, hardening liquids that upon impact, these liquids smeared over the armor would immediately harden to actually serve as instant bulletproof armor. Uh, by robbing the bullet of all of its kinetic energy. There's a lot of talk about really interesting augmentations, drugs that could be injected into a soldier's body to reduce the need for sleep, to reduce anxiety on the field of war. The future of, of war was considered to be technological. That was, that was uh, the future, the, the idea of augmenting a soldier physically, changing the limits of what a human can accomplish. The exoskeleton in question, enabling a soldier, according to some of these DARPA ideas, to jump a 30-foot wall in a single bound. I mean, turning humans into superheroes, effectively. How much of this is viable? How much of this was, you know, white paper speculation? But it got me to thinking, okay, what would that do to a person? So in the novel... The idea is that a lot of this was done. A lot of these soldiers were upgraded, given synthetic musculature to make them incredibly strong. And, of course, it drove them completely insane. And then the book is full of horrific anecdotes about people who butchered and ate their loved ones and so forth. And so the, the realization was that in order to augment people, to make them superhuman, to make them powerful, you have to select those who are already slightly disturbed because they're slightly better equipped to deal with it. So all of the persons involved in this, all of the people who, who are given these superhuman abilities, these federal agents, are either suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, general anxiety disorder, some cases psychosis, but that makes them better equipped to handle the augmentations to their body. But in order to do that, they sort of have to evaluate their psychological profile and figure out, what, what is it that they're into? Is it an oral fixation? Give them fangs and uh, create a vampire. Is it somebody who's feral, violent, prone to berserker rage? Right, werewolf. And so they're given surgical augmentation to make them look like whatever it is that they're supposed to be, werewolves and vampires. Part of that, interestingly enough, is based on truth as well. During the Second World War, uh, it was discovered that... Uh, some of the enemy were slightly more susceptible to fear uh, from supernatural elements than American soldiers. And at one point, the U.S. military discovered this, this Japanese legend about a, a fox that attacks in the night, this ghostly fox, 
So they get a bunch of foxes and paint them with glow-in-the-dark paint. And they're going to experiment with training these foxes to run into Japanese encampments and scare the hell out of the soldiers. <laughs> the foxes get loose somewhere in New York, and, and so people are reporting like seeing these ghost foxes running around upstate New York or something. So the military has to go catch all these damned foxes. I don't know if anything ever came of it. And in oh, another that's case... Fantastic. Yeah, true story. In another case, the U.S. military discovered that a group of soldiers, I believe in the Philippines, were terrified of this, this vampire legend. So when they caught soldiers, enemy soldiers, instead of bayoneting them or shooting them, they'd poke holes in their neck, hang them upside down to drain their blood, and then dump their corpses in the jungle. Uh, this psychological warfare was intended to persuade the enemy that this legend was true. And I got to thinking, that... That is amazing. What if you took that a step further? What if you actually tried to create through implanted teeth that actually function, through through these synthetic muscles that would enable someone to be stronger than any average human, uh, through lenses in the eyes that would enable someone to see in the dark? What if you sound like we're heading towards Predator there, Raphael? Uh, there are definitely sites. Yeah, there's there's definitely science fiction elements in in the novel as well. It's it's a, a sort of a mashup of the Tom Clancy thriller minus the jingoism, um, and and there's urban fantasy with vampires and werewolves running amok. There's cyberpunk with all of these synthetic augmentations. It's it's kind of a mess actually. <laughs> but but a very cool mess. I've, I've read the first book and yeah, even though you did shoot me in the head, I enjoyed it thoroughly. <laughs> I apologize for that, but I don't really apologize. So, Scott, you were a character in the book? Oh, for one paragraph. Uh, he was uh, the prime minister. Yes. <laughs> of where? So, the, the UK, yes. I, uh, I couldn't do a worse job, could I? Anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, so, so, I... I so, so, so it's, it's something of a, um, a modern renaissance man, Raphael. I mean, you, you also design tabletop RPGs, which you know, is what I, I suppose most people who are listening might know you for. Um, in, in particular, you, you've just um, released the latest version of uh, the project you've been working on you know, off and on for the last 10 years, the Books of Pandemonium. Um, I... I, I can sort of potentially see, you know, some Lovecraftian influences in the, uh, not so much in the mythology of it, but certainly in the creature design. Was that a conscious thing, or have you just drawn upon absolutely everything that, that you've been influenced by? There's definitely a Lovecraftian feel to a lot of the angels, and some of the demons as well, in the book. The, the thing about Pandemonio is that it is sort of um, my take on, on what horror gaming usually turns into at my table, which is a, a high-speed bloodbath. There's very little room for angst in the story. There's very little room for cosmic or existential horror. Everybody's too busy trying to decide, is this the appropriate time to indulge in cannibalism? No? Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> so it it is more of a splatterpunk type of horror. So you're right. Thematically, it doesn't have a lot of common ground. With, with Lovecraft's mythology. Um, however, visually, some of the, the entities with the, the you know these, these vast cyclopean lumbering monstrosities that blunder through cities knocking over buildings, tentacles undulating, definitely look like the you know elder gods in some in some respects. Uh, in addition, there are books in the game itself. In the game you will encounter these these eldritch tomes and reading them invariably causes some dreadful havoc to ensue. I don't want to spoil too much but there's you know there's always a chance when you pick up a book and read it in order to learn an extremely powerful spell that for example um, a billion people could die. Like literally just a nice round number one billion people all around the world uh, or perhaps originating in a you know a radius around you will just fall over and die that's always a risk when you read one of these incredibly powerful eldritch tomes and it's far more feasible for me as a, a game master to incorporate something like that than it is it's funny because I do adore Lovecraft and I, I love the game Call of Thulu I've been playing it forever but sometimes it's hard to communicate that cosmic horror to a table full of bloodthirsty savages like the people in my gaming group. 
But if you say, well, a billion people might die, then that, that for some reason that meat, you know, that, that flesh and bone has a more visceral impact, and they think, wow, do I really? No, nah, let, let's go ahead and open it up. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, um, Matt, it's only a statistic Matt, anyway. So. Next game, when I give you a book and say a billion people are going to die when you read this book, what are you going to say, Matt? Uh, well, half a second later, it's right. What's on the first paragraph? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking of that line that oh, there's always uh, having to work out what's the best time for cannibalism. There's any time. <laughs> no brain there. Yeah, what's the can- hold up? Let's do it. Yes, yeah, cannibalism is not just fine. cannibalism. It's not just for breakfast anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, you, you, you mentioned, you know, obviously the Lovecraftian influence, but there's, there's a hell of a lot more that goes into the books of Pantomimian. I, what, what, what other stuff did you find yourself drawing upon? My mother grew up in an orphanage in Peru. She was raised by nuns, and as a little kid, I was told stories of what it was like and she would sometimes describe these murals that had been painted on the walls depicting demons ripping the flesh of the damned and whenever the little girls did something wrong the nuns would say that is what is going to happen to you and these apparently were quite graphic descriptions and later in life uh, I remember as a slightly older kid, having developed an interest in comic books, going to a fabric store my mother used to sew, and I would sit by this comic book rack at the front of the store while she went into the back and looked through yards of fabric, and the comic books were deeply religious. I don't know the name of the company that made these comics. I've searched off and on over the years, but they were utterly ghastly. There was one depicting um, a man who, in a fit of rage, took out a bullwhip and began to whip a child and lashed most of the flesh off of this person's face and back. And then years later, ran across the child, now an adult, and was forgiven because of the love of the Savior. And the man had this epiphany and realized his folly and fell to his knees and confessed his sins. And I remember looking at this comic book thinking, what the fuck is this? Take away the religious stuff, and this is kind of cool. You know? I, I, Yeah. This is what somebody looks like on the inside. And uh, at that point, I discovered that I actually kind of enjoy the macabre. And of course, there's also that sensation, that notion in the back of one's mind should I be upset with myself for finding this to be rather cool? Yes, perhaps, but it doesn't change anything. These comics, however disgusting and horrifying, and let me tell you, there were some very twisted things in these comics. To this day, I don't understand what genius thought, hey, let's make some religious comics about, oh, I don't know, let's show the crucifixion in graphic detail and hang those up at the front of a fabric store for the kids, I guess. But it left an indelible impression on me. And I think now, as I'm pushing 40 and looking back on my life and thinking about, what the hell am I doing here anyhow? That this twisted Catholicism, the shadow of it that I grew up in. You know, we went to Catholic church when I was a little kid, and and it was old school. They spoke in Latin the entire time. I had no idea what the fuck they were saying. But it was beautiful. Everything was covered in gold. All the priests came out dressed in their dresses or whatever the called it. You know, it was wonderful and interesting and fascinating. It made no sense to me, but it left that impression that on the one hand, the formality of it all, on the other hand, the sadism that runs through pretty much any narrative about any religious organization if you dig deep enough. And this constant threat of this twisted afterlife and the punishment for one's sins, which all resemble character traits of every person I've ever met. Gluttony and lust. Really? You know? Really? That's Those are vices now? I mean, look around. Those are vices. Those are tendencies. Those are characteristics of Homo sapiens. It's fascinating to me, uh, and and this this all of these ideas gelled in my mind. And I do remember when I first released uh, the first book of Pandemonium, maybe eleven years ago now. Somebody wrote in a review that the 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 heaven and hell dichotomy, the question of angels and demons and sin and wickedness 
just didn't make a whole lot of sense in a, a a culture where horror was defined by things like Buffy and Lovecraft, where God and hell didn't really play into it. And I thought, well, it is funny because I am an atheist, and yet here I am writing about angels and such. But to me, it was a matter of exorcism of all these these ideas that I'd accumulated as a child. So that's where a lot of the overtones of the books of Pandemonium come in, the, the, the notion of, of sin and punishment and eternal torment. But none of it in an ethereal or metaphysical manner. The, the punishment of a demon or angel in this role-playing game is quite visceral. I mean, they, they, they go for your prostate. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point. That, yeah, I, you don't have to be a believer, I think, to find you know religious imagery powerful. It, it, it's it's such a strong cultural influence on all of us that you know even if you end up approaching it as mythology, it's it, it still has that resonance. Yeah, I think there's a there's a kind of an underlying thing there because we've all generally you know we've all grown up in a kind of a, a Christian society to some degree. And whether we're atheists or whether we're kind of religious believers, the the whole kind of this this whole religious mythology is is very much you know a part of our psyche. Whereas vampires and werewolves and and so on, yeah, they're kind of out there and they can be portrayed as as scary. I don't think they ever kind of cut to that real underlying fears that that um you know like the power of the exorcist and so on. Um, and uh, what we see in, uh, you know, even a show like Supernatural, once it gets onto angels and demons, and it kind of gets into that whole Christian mythology thing, um, it goes on to another level, I think. Mm. And it seems strange to question why you would use the Christian mythology when you said that like Buffy and um, Lovecraft were, were so popular. But yeah, I mean. Clearly, the the Buffy and the Lovecraftian thing are made up. So, you know, if people are saying, "Oh, we don't believe in the Christian one," that's just made up. Well, what? You know, they're all surely they're all equally made up. They're all <laughs> equally powerful. No, Lovecraft is real. Well, we, we can't we can't declare that on uh, on uh, on a public broadcast. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll take that bit out in editing later. The truth yeah. <laughs> we know you're an agent for the Al Hazred. Um, <laughs> organization. It's true. It's true. Deep cover. <laughs> so it's actually an expose rather than work of fiction. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Autobiographical. So can we take a step back for the listener and for me um, and just cover exactly what role playing games you have written? Because they're. So what, what did you start off with? So uh, there's actually. Uh, a bit of a story. The first book of Pandemonium was released in 2002. The full title is Dread, the first book of Pandemonium. And I've changed the name because there is another game named Dread which uses Jenga blocks. It's a great game. You can find it at tiltingatwindmills.net and it actually lends itself quite well to Call of Thulu gaming. The Jenga block game uh, which is worked on by this, this group of people um, who call themselves the Impossible Dream uh, involves building up a tower of Jenga blocks and and, and and then pulling them every time you have to make a decision. So it's a physical, tangible mechanism. It's really neat. Uh, so to avoid confusion, I've dropped the word dread from the title of my game. The second book of Pandemonium was called Spite, and Spite, the second book of Pandemonium, came out in 2009. Dread was about demons, and Spite was about angels. And in both cases, you play a supernatural warrior whose job is to protect humans from the onslaught of the minions of heaven or hell during the last war which is being fought on earth. So it's a bit of this tribulation, the notion that rapture is coming, but rapture basically involves somebody ripping out your bowels. But it's all quiet, it's all underground, it's all happening in the shadows, in the alleys, and the police don't know about it, and so you, you, you're the supernatural private investigator slash soldier on the front lines hunting demons and then in, in spite hunting angels. So for this new edition I combined both games because they both use the same D12 system. Dread and Spite had slightly different systems but I, I, I streamlined uh, both of them, combined them and added a few new features that I've been playtesting over the past couple of years and released the entire thing as a game called Pandemonio and it features all the material from the previous games um, 
plus a bunch of new features and, and demons and new angels and, and magic. And new features like uh, the abattoir. Whenever your characters are feeling poorly, you can take the corpses of people that you've killed and throw them into this gigantic skyscraper that no one else can see, and their bodies fly up through this chute and emerge from the top of the skyscraper and tumble up into space God knows where. Your characters actually don't know why that works, but it does. So that's the kind of game that Pandemonio is. And that was, uh, like I said, that, that's something I've been working on off and on for, yeah, about 11 years now, publishing new editions or supplementary material. I also worked on um, a game called View Scream. I play a lot of Google Plus Hangout games. One of the things that comes up a lot is that when you've got character sheets and you're rolling dice and you're crumpling your paper, or even if you're using apps or, or programs that, that enable you to do a lot of this digitally, it's still a lot to keep track of. And when you've got that face-to-face -face connection, it's a little bit easier when you're sitting around a table when you're playing a game online through the, through the camera's lens, listening through it in your headphones. You've got people with, you know, keyboard clatter, and you've got kids wailing in the background, uh, dogs baying at the moon. There's a lot of chaos. So I thought to myself, what if you had a really, really streamlined game in which you're not talking about your character in the third person. You're not saying, okay, my guy opens the door, or even saying, I open the door. But instead, you're playing a game in the first person through the entirety of the experience, right? You literally are, well, you're practically LARPing in a sense, right? You play as the character, you speak as the character. You don't announce decisions. You simply say, all right, I've opened the door. I, I got nothing, guys. And the entire game takes place in a very short, tight time frame, 60 to 90 minutes tops. Most games, in fact, that I've played have been about 45 minutes to an hour. And you have a GM for that? And there's no GM. There's no GM. It, right. It's a GMless game in which four people play four members of a starship crew that's stranded or in jeopardy in some way and can only communicate through view screens uh, on the ship or on the station or what have you. And they're separated because of quantum interference or the, the hull's been breached and... and uh, uh, there's aliens or xenomorphs or, or enemy drones on board the vessel. So you're stuck in engineering, and you're talking to somebody who's in the medical bay, and you also have somebody on the bridge, and you're all trying to help each other escape this vessel. And there's definitely Lovecraft pretty much all over this game. Um, there's one scenario called The Color Out of Space. It's color as in C-U-L-L-E-R, a ship that culls debris. And The Color Out of Space is stranded out. Um, in outer space, and there's some tentacled monstrosity trying to get inside. Is it Azathoth? Could be. Trying to get inside your vessel. And your shipmates are going insane and committing suicide en masse, and you're, you're trying to escape. There's another one called the Kul of Kulat Nunu, and the call of Kulat Nunu is about... Well, Kulat Nunu is actually a, a star system not too far from here, but it sounds a little bit like Cthulhu, so I thought that was kind of fun. And again, you, you know, you're, you're stuck in outer space and terrible things are happening and you're, you're all trying to, to rescue one another. But really, due to the way that the game is set up, there are no dice, but you, you, you have a certain number of problems you can solve as a character. And you have to decide who to help and who will be told, I, I can't do anything about that. And so ultimately, of the four, only a few will survive. Like At least one person is going to at the end of the scenario, realize their problems have not been solved yet, meaning they don't get to the airlock, meaning they get to narrate their death. Some people kill their camera and scream, uh, you know, or some people give these horrible, bitter, sad farewells. Other people rant and, and, and rave before the lights go out. And it's great fun. It's great cinematic, theatrical fun, and it, it tends to produce really interesting scenarios. And I did a Google search on it, uh, well, actually a YouTube search, and discovered there's about a half a dozen videos of people who've played the game and uploaded the footage, and cool. in fact, some of them have done screen overlays where if you look at their faces, it looks like they're inside of a screen, you know, with with uh, fake static and, and um, a little metallic border around it, just like you're on a starship. Oh, it's fascinating what people have done with this game. So, Raphael, can I ask, so I, th that sounds great, and I, I obviously I need to, to play it. Um, how does it actually work then? How, how, so we actually, um, we decide, you know, the four of us are playing View Scream, but there's no GM, there's no dice, there's no... What, what kind of mechanics that actually help the shape the fiction when you're, when you're actually playing it? Is it? I mean, surely it's not just totally improvised. And you, there's some Correct. kind of structure to it because you talked about some kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do have... For each scenario, you have a one-page overview of what, what's going on, and it's pretty terse. 
every character sheet tells you what are your problems. And for example, you might say, okay, I'm in the medical bay, and um, some kind of quantum interference outside. I just saw a crew member just torn in half by the stuff. This flux just went through him and killed him. Somebody needs to do something. But specifically, it will tell you. The only person who can resolve this crisis is somebody in the engineering uh, bay who can actually deal with this. Whereas if you're engineering, your problem might be, I've been exposed to some kind of toxin and it's working its way up my arm. I'm losing sensation um, and I've got these cysts and boils all over my hand. I don't know what I've been exposed to. Medical is the only one, obviously, who could help you with that. The bridge has no idea what that means. Medical might say, all right, I'm going to send over a drone equipped with a retroviral sequencer to take a blood sample and I'm going to try to reverse engineer a cure based on that sample. Now on medical's character sheet it tells him you've got X number of successes and X number of failures. You have to scratch one off every time you deal with a problem. So you decide okay is this going to succeed or fail and then you narrate the result and you scratch off that, that success or failure. Right. So somebody's going to get shafted at some point. Now, you might do that early, but that would be bad because then you've made an enemy. So maybe it's better to say, all right, let me get back to you on that, you know, and then go help someone and then go help someone else and say, listen, while I'm working on that, I need you to do something for me. And the thing is, because there's no GM to moderate, really it does come down to your personality. And a lot of times you'll see people who are, who are adept at bullying other, character, other players, really, <laughs> into helping them or trying to wheedle or coerce. But what's equally fun is uh, that, of course, subplots emerge because on your character sheet it'll say you don't trust engineering. You know engineering is a complete prick. He's a bastard. Um, or you saw medical do something horrible. What was it? And, you know, the character narrates, and medical, it says, you know you've done something, but you can't remember what, but somebody else saw you do it. So when that person says, I saw you, I saw you molesting that cadaver, there's nothing you can say as medical. You're just like, I don't remember. You know, I have no memory of that. Why Why would I do that? And so the game typically degenerates into accusations and, and blood, but that's the core mechanic of it, though. Just that, that, that list of successes or failures that tells you how many times you can save someone before you run out of successes, and from that point forward, anytime anybody asks you for help, you just have to say, sure, I'll try. Oh, I'm sorry, it didn't work you're going to die. That sounds very cool, and I very much like the idea. I mean, I think you're the first person that I've come across, certainly, to come up with a game actually written for what we are doing now, which is uh, a, a Google Hangout or a Skype-type um, um, conversation, rather than uh, taking, you know, Pathfinder or, or Call of Cthulhu or something and, and making some kind of dice rolling and mapping app so that you can play the game on computer. You've actually come up with a game kind of which is native to this environment, which is uh, a stroke of genius, I think. Oh, thanks. Uh, and it's a damn fun game. Uh, uh, I, I, I like some of the variants that are published in the book as well. I, I played Crystal Barn with you a while back, and that, yeah, that, that was so much fun. Thanks. Yeah, that was a great game. Crystal Ball is uh, view screen, but in a different setting. It's a group of wizards who are gathering, and they're, they're consulting their, their crystal orbs, and they're um, they're, they're scrying mirrors, and they're all communicating about these threats to the kingdom. So you've got a necromancer, a druid, and each of them similarly has certain abilities. The necromancer can summon the dead, and the, the, the druid can use ancient, uh, I don't know, ents and so forth to, uh, to help the other wizards. And, and of course, they're all in four different towers across the kingdom. And then there's um, there's one about zombies. If you've got a general and uh, an analyst over at the CDC, and these these four people are all communicating through Google chat or, or what have you about this zombie infestation, and the general says, "Well, I'll send in an airstrike," you know, and and the the medical personnel are saying, "Well, we can disseminate this this antiviral through through CDC channels and see if that helps." But yeah, it does lend itself to different scenarios. It's actually pretty fun. Mm. I can see, uh, see Scott as being the type of player, though, that would immediately burn up all his failures in the first five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to defend myself on this front, but no, that's exactly what I did. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> you, you resemble and, that, and, Mark. <laughs> and Matt, Matt, what would you do with all those successes? 
Well, I'll probably channel them into something. <laughs> probably channel them into something completely pointless. Knowing my, uh, it's my not like dice. You tendency. actually get successes. Yeah, um, I know. It's like, this is such a rare thing for me. Yeah. So I wanted to ask. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Raphael. So why? I mean, it sounds like um, you come very much <clears throat> come very much from a, a setting kind of approach to designing the game. Is that right? I mean, our, our kind of um, was it? It was very much the setting first, and then kind of mechanics. To support that afterwards, I think that's true. Yeah. So it wasn't that you could sort of um, take another game um, and just apply it to your setting. You you felt compelled to kind of design a new game. I do. Yeah. Most of the time, it's because once I start envisioning what's going to happen at the table, I I try to create something that will make that possible and. I've played a lot of systems, and sometimes when I get together with the gaming group, or sometimes when I'm playing with friends, it's just, hey, let's use whatever game that is. But a lot of the time, when I'm playing with my, my regular team, there's sort of an idea about what kind of experience I want to have. And so, yeah, I want to craft a, a, a mechanic that supports that experience, that, that produces that kind of high-speed, low-drag fun, or that tension, or whatever. And what doesn't kind always of, work. Um, and, and again, for... I guess for listeners who who haven't maybe encountered um, the books of Pandemonium, what kind of um, rule system would you compare it to in terms of complexity or or whatever? How could you kind of compare it to something else? It's not a very. Or can you give us a kind of overview, perhaps? Yeah, it's it's not a very complicated system. It uses d12 dice pools, which is kind of a subject of much hilarity here and there. I mean, who uses the d12? Um, there aren't that many games that use. That's right. That's right. Somebody owes me. And, I mean, people have posted dice porn pictures of their D12 collections after playing my games. I'm proud of that. Um, now, there's, there's a few. There was, uh, I think, Pokethulu, which is a very strange name for a game because it's a mashup of Pokemon and Cthulhu. That uses D12s. Uh, Killer Bunnies is a card game that, for some reason, uses D12s. Anyhow. <laughs> um, <laughs> So in my game, you, you roll uh, a group of d12s, and the director does the same, and then you compare the high number. But where it gets interesting is there are various stunts that allow you to do things to your director that are really horrible. For example, you can steal the highest number that your director rolls. Or if you roll a lot of multiples, like you roll a bunch of 11s, you can take all of your director's 11s and just add them to your own dice pool by using a particular stunt. Or you can force the director to roll a single die and compare it to your two dice. Um, they're, they're just various stunts that allow you to sort of play with the dice pool. It's not just you roll, I roll, we're done. And the other thing about it that makes it slightly fun is that if you roll multiples, you add the number of instances to the, the number. For example, if you rolled four 11s, that would be 15, 4 plus 11. So there's an incentive to rolling more dice because the more dice you roll, the better the likelihood that you're going to roll a multiple of something high, like a couple of 10s or a bunch of 9s. Um, and that's the gist of it. That's really it. That's that's. And the when core I look at my mechanic. character sheet, am I seeing um, the kind of traditional approach to kind of characteristics and skills, or am I seeing um, kind of a bunch of uh, uh, kind of handcrafted traits? Or there's yeah, there's definitely a, a very traditional core. You, you have a violence score whenever you're kicking down a door or kicking down someone's face. You, you roll whatever your violence score is in in d12s. Um, reflex is for dodging. Magic is when you cast a spell. It's all pretty traditional in that regard. And you have skills, intimidation, and uh, journalism, and so forth. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be pretty traditional for people who are RPG enthusiasts. And, and and through play, do you kind of acquire power? Is it or is it kind of a game of um, attrition? You know, as a as a player character. After I've played you, a few sessions, am I totally screwed up and hopeless, or am I kind of, you know, more powerful than I was at the start? It's it's interesting because yeah, you do gain attributes and abilities over time. Every time you close out a case by killing a demon or an angel, your character gains new abilities, new spells, new skills. But at the same time, a lot of what you have to do in order to complete a case incurs decay. And decay is a physical deterioration. You become horrific. You become demonic in your appearance. You even have to do terrible things in order to stay alive. Literally, physically, in order to live, you, you have to do horrible things when decay gets high enough. And the only cures are uh, either dump the corpses of people that you've killed into this abattoir or uh, 
there are certain spells that can help you, but there's a, usually a really horrible cost. And the cover of the player guide depicts a, a woman smiling, holding a handful of bloody teeth, and there's this demonic creature with its arm around her shoulder, and in the back there's a man crucified, well, actually nailed to the wall in sort of a parody of the Vitruvian man pose. His bones have been uh, exposed, his arm bones, and nailed to the wall. And then below that, the skin of his arm has been nailed to the wall as well. So you've got the sort of Vitruvian man look to him. His side has been pierced, and there's blood uh, all over his mouth. Clearly, that's where his teeth were yanked out. And it might look like this is a woman who's been influenced or coerced by a demon into committing some act of sadism or cruelty. But later, as you read the book, you realize... Uh, this woman is a member of a team, and so is the demon. And the demon is actually a person who's susceptible to decay, who's succumbed to decay, and is in danger of losing humanity and becoming a demon that must then be hunted and killed by the group. The only way to, to reverse this was to cast a spell that required taking an innocent person, nailing him to the wall, pulling out all of his teeth, and killing him. That's what the players have to do in order to... Uh, compensate for this decay, but of course, sometimes players will actually say, "I, I can't. I, I'd, I'd rather just become a monster and die," you know. And and so there is that choice that eventually has to get made. Your your decay score gets high enough. That's that's the fate that awaits you. I was thinking that was a fun bit, person. <laughs> it can be. Yeah, I, I I've also encountered. Very few games in which it's quite as much fun to die as the books of Pandemonium, uh, because of the whole going out in the blaze of glory aspect. Mm -hmm. That's true. When your character loses uh, all of his, his hit points, blood, but hit points, um, you become insanely powerful, and that lasts for a very short time, basically the remainder of the case. But all of your attributes go up, and your 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 you know, life score, your blood score goes back up to 12, and you become incredibly powerful for a short period of time, enabling you to close out the case and then narrate your death however it is you plan on going out. And I think that was just because it was such a high fatality game um, <laughs> that my gaming group habitually was down to one person and five people watching as, as the last brawl played out. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if they could all participate and then all just one by one, you know, light that final cigarette and keel over, or explode, or burst into flame, or drive the tractor into the side of the demon, and then it catches fire. Um, and that's where that mechanic came from. And it works. It works like a charm, especially for pickup games and con games. And people are like, really? I can do whatever idiotic thing pops into my head and not worry too much about the consequences? Well, let's not creep around. Kick the damn door down and see what's going on, you know? <laughs> so it, it does help. Yeah, I, I've seen some incredibly memorable deaths at conventions. Uh, with uh, yeah, I, I think I think the most spectacular one was someone grabbing a demon on the top of uh, a skyscraper building, uh, and jumping off with it and unloading the clip of an automatic rifle into it all the way down to the ground. Wow. Yeah, yeah I remember that. It was off the top of the BBC headquarters in London, if I remember right. Uh, that's right. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh -huh. So it plays very well as a convention game and over a number of sessions as well. I mean, is it, is yeah. it the kind of game that you might sort of play, I don't know, say five or six sessions of with, with one group of characters and then move on to another group? Or is it something that would kind of run, you know, kind of ongoing? Or it sounds yeah. like not. There's a great deal of information and additional rules for ongoing campaigns. Your characters can become more powerful, and at which point their their conflicts move out of the shadows um, and become more global in scope. There are organizations, federal agencies, military initiatives, corporations, cults with global reach, and there are also incredibly powerful angels waiting in the wings uh, far more powerful than the ordinary possessors that you run across or the tormentors that you run across in the game who, who live to just target individuals. And there are even some angels who exist solely to hunt down the player characters and kill them because they're perceived as threats. So if you were to play the game over a long period of time, the characters would eventually become more and more powerful, but then so would the opposition. And the threats would become far more complicated. Instead of investigating a house where th strange things have happened or... Rumors of a serial killer who can walk through walls or burst into flame. Instead, you've got federal agencies that 
conduct experiments like MK Ultra, but satanic. So yeah, it does lend itself to long-term play as well. Cool. No, the characters don't always make it that far. <laughs> I, I, as well as the books of Pandemonium and, and View Screen, you've also been involved a fair bit with um, uh, the old school Renaissance, uh, haven't you? I, you, uh, you put out a very successful supplement to the Tarratic Tome, and you've been working on Lamentations of the Flame Princess as well? Correct. Uh, the Tarratic Tome started when I had the idea that it would be really neat if I could take all the demons and angels from Dread and Spite, because there are about 150 of them, and convert them to old school rules of some kind and release that as a monster manual. But in the end, the f uh, of the final book, the Tarratic Tome, I think only about half of it came from the books of Pandemonium's Demons and Angels roster, and the rest of it was just invented from whole cloth uh, or borrowed from my gaming table. A lot of times when we're playing Dungeons and Dragons or a game of that type at my, my table with, with my regular group, I'll just make up um, monsters that they're not going to be familiar with, that look familiar, a new species of Lamia or a new type of Gorgon, something that is going to be familiar enough but still is going to throw them off balance and they won't know exactly how to proceed because, of course, there's the possibility that, you know, it's got toxic blood or... or acidic spittle or something. Or maybe it's not even uh, an enemy. Maybe it's neutral good. It just happens to resemble a demonic creature. So I took a lot of those elements, a lot of those monsters, and statted them out as Osric entities and created this book, The Tyratic Tome. And I think a lot of the sales were due to nostalgia. It does look like one of the 1970s monster manuals. It's got the orange spine, it's a hardcover with similar font, and I did as an homage to the books that I loved so much as a, a kid make it up to, to look like the original Monster Manual or Monster Manual 2. Um, that, was kind of, that was kind of fun. It was really neat. I enjoyed it a lot. And then I released a dungeon called Slaughter Grid. And Slaughter Grid is a dungeon with some pretty grotesque elements. And actually, that's got a bit of the Lovecraft in it as well. There's an entity in there that's very Lovecraftian in a way that Lovecraft probably would not have approved of. But it's there. That's all I'll say on that subject, except that it's, it's a pretty vile, ugly little dungeon where death is a strategy. Death is something you, you do. Like committing suicide is actually something that your character does um, in order to achieve a goal of some kind. Like, we can't get across this chasm. No problem, I'll slit my own throat. That's actually something that happened during playtesting. <laughs> so, and it works. It's, it's, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, then, then yeah, I, I talked to uh, James Raggy, the creator of Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and I did uh, an adventure for him called No Salvation for Witches, NSFW. And that one is finished, and it's in the editing and then layout stages, and eventually will be released, I guess, as a PDF in a print book. And it's a neat little adventure. It takes place at... Um, at this this priory, uh, after the um, dissolution of the monasteries, after all the monasteries in the UK had been shut down and and well sacked more or less, uh, this group of this coven of witches takes over this abandoned priory, and horrible things happen, and the players stumble across this, and and chaos ensues. It's extremely fun and violent, and it's a bit of a commentary on art and dance. I have a friend who teaches dance, and I've observed a few of... I've actually participated in a few of her programs, not as a dancer. Uh, I've uh, been in charge of lighting or sound for some of her, her group's performances. And um, I don't know. Dance is really interesting to me. It's nothing I could ever do, but I love to watch it, and I love to, uh, to think about its implications in terms of uh, eviscerating people. So that's what that adventure is about. And then uh, it, was, it was kind of interesting, actually. J James Raggy was working on a new Lamentations source book and had the idea that one of the stretch goals for this Kickstarter campaign would be Raphael Channel will write a couple of monsters if you want. And the end tally was about 50. 50 people had contributed enough to justify this... Uh, entire bestiary in the book. It's going to be massive, so I've been working on that all week. 
and I'm going to be writing a total of 50 new monsters for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Brand new, oh, all nice. of them utterly repulsive. And he told me that he's basically taking the leech off, and I'm free to just go as far as I want, which is great. I mean, that's usually where I like to play. You know, that's that's the kind of playground I enjoy. No restrictions, no limits, whatever horrible idea pops into my head is fine. So yeah, that's that's the extent, I think, of my, my OSR involvement, and I've enjoyed every minute of it, because I still play uh, AD&D um, pretty regularly with my group. Hmm. Nice. Well, I think we've... Um... I've got, I've got made a few notes. I've got quite a few more things that we could ask, but um, we're coming up towards the hour here, so should we look to be drawing it to a close, guys? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, yes, we, we, we could probably talk for another hour easily. So, um, well, maybe yes, we have Raphael back um, on a future date to talk about some of these things more in depth. Particu I'm particularly would... intrigued about how you're going to do 50 monsters and make them all different, but that's maybe for a, for a future show. So one of the I things I'd like to... We'll find out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be concluded, dot, dot, dot. I guess, um, can we just go into... Now that um, we were all kind of inspired by, um, by your work, uh, where do we go to get it? Where do we go to get um, Pandemonia, for example? Is it available in paper edition and pr uh, PDF, or is it just PDF? How do we get hold of it? Yeah, my website is raphaelchandler.com. Um, and I spell it with an F, uh, not the PH like the artist, but R-A-F. And if you go there and click on the RPGs link, you'll see all the RPGs that I published to date. And they're all available via Lulu, Amazon, and DriveThruRPG. So you can get them in print or in PDF, hardcover or softcover if you prefer. And that's where my novel is also sold. And um, I have a blog... I don't know why, but I do. Yep, so the things we've talked about, Pandemonia, View Scream, uh, your novel, um, Hex Communicated, Thoracic Tome, and Slaughter Grid, basically just go to your website and they're all there. Correct. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, um, talking of where to find stuff, should we wrap up by reminding everyone that... Uh, we can be found on Google Plus as the good friends of Jackson Elias. We've got a community there. We can be found on uh, Facebook as the good friends of Jackson Elias. And we can be found on Twitter as the good friends of J.E. Uh, and in this one instance on YouTube as well, scarily enough. Yes, yes. I think this is actually going to go down under my YouTube account. But, um, yeah, we haven't set one up for the good friends of Jackson Elias yet. I'll, I'll sort something out along those lines. Um, but uh, yes, and as Paul said earlier, you can find us on blasphemousterms.com as well. And if there are any problems with this show, it's probably because of the lack of white Russians, it being before midday here. Um, that's, that's never stopped me before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's got milk in it, you can pour it over your breakfast cereal. Exactly, you can oh. put it in coffee, I can do it, yeah, it's just... In this, in this combination. Wow, I never thought of that. That changes <laughs> everything. <laughs> well, it's probably breakfast time for you, Raphael, so enjoy. Thank you. It is. It's 7.30 in the morning. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for having me on the show. Yeah, big oh, thank you to Raphael Chandler. Yeah, big thank and if there's, yes. unless there's anything else, we'll wrap up there and say um, goodbye, everybody, and see you again next week. Or, in fact, maybe you won't see us again for a while, but uh, you'll hear us. Yes. And goodbye. Voices at the end of the microphone. Cheerio. See ya. And farewell. Bye-bye.